Okay, we're going to talk about uh, experimental designs, types of experimental designs. Uh, the first is completely randomized. Um, completely randomized is similar uh, to in sampling in SRS. All experimental units are allocated at random among all treatment groups. So to give you a visual of random assignment, Okay, notice each box has, you know, about equal uh, blues and uh, pinks. Okay, completely randomized. Randomized block is another type of experimental design. This is when units are blocked into groups homogeneously and then randomly assigned to treatments. So this is similar to a stratified in regards to sampling. So homogeneous groups, again, this could be gender, this could be socioeconomic level, this could be um, whatever you think might be causing a difference um, in the experiment. And again, you should only uh, block units based on what variable affects the response. Okay, so again, if you think there's going to be a difference between genders, then group them separately, uh, males, females. Uh, maybe you think there's going to be a different response based on age levels than block against age levels um, and so forth. So again, to give you a visual of what a randomized block is, first you're going to put into homogeneous groups. And then you're going to randomly assign. Half get treatment A, half get treatment B. So notice in our two groups, half of the groups are getting treatment A, half are getting treatment B. Matched pairs is another type of experimental design, and that is when a special type of block design, and that is when we match up experimental units according to similar characteristics and randomly assign one to one treatment and the other automatically gets the second treatment. Okay, so just as it says a matched pairs is your pairing two by two based on a common characteristic. Um, and examples of these a uh, perfect example would be like twin studies, you know, there's lots of studies on twins because they're they have the most similar uh, chromosomal identity. Uh, sometimes it could be a couple study of the couples are already paired together. Um, it could be taste test, okay? Taste test is an example of a matched pairs where you have one person trying two different things. So again, you have the bias of that one person affecting uh, both tastings, or you could have um, a before and after. One person results before something, before treatment is exposed, and then the after results. So again, whatever variables are affecting that person, um, those variables are tied to both uh, responses. Um, so one way to do it is have each unit do both treatments in random order. Uh, that's an example of the taste test and before and after effects. Okay, yes, you have the same person again, but you are getting two different outputs from it. And the assignment of treatments is dependent. Okay. So to give you a visual of a matched pairs. Again, we are grouping based on a common characteristic, but we're grouping two by two. And then one gets one side, the other gets the other. So this is one way to do a matched pairs design. Another way is to have the individual unit do both treatments as in a taste test. Uh, so some more uh, definitions, again, make these flashcards. A lurking variable. A lurking variable is a variable that is not among the explanatory or the response variable in a study, but it may influence the response variable. Confounding variable. 
It occurs when two variables are associated in such a way that their effects on a response variable cannot be distinguished from each other, okay? Um, so compounding happens when, okay, yeah, we're doing an experiment, we think this is changing it, but what other factors might be um, affecting it as well? So uh, lurking and compounding, very similar. They're basically stating what else could be affecting the data besides um, the reason for the experiment. So suppose we wish to test a new deodorant against one currently on the market. So we're separating them into, uh, we're se separating our subjects into two homogeneous groups. One group is assigned to treatment A and the other group is assigned to treatment B. What's wrong with this picture? Well, what do we notice? If all of one group gets all of A and the entire other group gets treatment B, are we really gonna be able to determine if um, that treatment is really making a difference? We don't know. We don't know if it's based on, on uh, the gender or the separation of what you split the groups by or if it's the treatment case. Okay, so treatment and group are what we call compounded. Confounding does not occur in a completely randomized design. Which is why, just like in sampling, oftentimes, um, you know, we always want to uh, randomly assign. And again, you should only block if you think that that might affect the data. So an example, an article from USA Today reports the number of victims of violent crimes per 1,000 people. 51, crime, 51 victims have never been married, 42 are divorced or separated, 13 are married, eight are widowed. Is this an experiment, why or why not? Well, no, this is not an experiment. All you're doing is you're looking at data, okay? You're not telling anybody to do anything. Um, an experiment requires you to tell somebody to do something, um, not just observing data that's already happened. So what is the potential compounding variables? Um, well, let's think about age, okay? If you're, if you're relating crimes to whether they're married or not, uh, younger people are more at risk to be victims of crime, violent crimes, uh, might be because they're more active. Um, you could think about, um, we don't know where, what part of the country uh, these, this data was taken from. It could be maybe the area, the certain area that the data is coming from. Uh, but age is probably the biggest uh, factor in that as you know, you're not mature, you have a, your brain hasn't fully developed and you're making decisions, um, not the greatest of decisions, which is um, why crimes uh, tend to occur probably at a younger age. You get wiser supposedly as you get older. So four new uh, word processing programs are to be compared by measuring the speed with which standard tasks can be completed. 100 volunteers are randomly assigned to one of the four programs and their speeds are measured. This is an experiment, why or why not? Well, yes, it is an experiment. A treatment is imposed, okay? Um, if you're testing word processing programs, um, you're telling people to work on these programs. So what type of design is this? It's a completely randomized, okay? It doesn't say, oh, I'm separating people based on any characteristic. What's the factors and the levels? Well, we have one factor, it's a word pro processing program, but it has four levels, okay? What's the response? What are we measuring when we're getting these people on these word processing programs? We are measuring their speed, how fast they are actually typing. So in the same scenario, is there a potential confounding variable? 
Is there something else that could be affecting the data besides word processing? Well, no, in a completely randomized design, you shouldn't have any confounding variables. But can we approve upon this design? So while we can't call these fully confounding variables, is there a way to maybe do a different type of experiment to get us even uh, better results? We could do a block design where each person uses each program in random order. Um, you could also maybe separate by age to see if age uh, makes a difference. Um, so there are other ways that you could improve to get uh, a different tailoring of results. So another example, suppose that the manufacturer wants to test a new fertilizer against the current one on the market. 10 two acre plots of land scattered throughout the country county are used, each plot is subdivided into two subplots, one of which is treated with the current fertilizer and the other with the new. Weed is planted and the crop yields are measured. So what type of design is this? Well, it's a matched pairs. Again, we're splitting uh, 10 acre plots into two, so that's a matched pairs. Uh, why are we using a matched pairs? Why are we using a matched pairs? Well, the, the, the area that uh, the area that the acreage is at uh, could be affecting. So if you have if you have a plot of land that's maybe closer to water, it may be affecting the crop growth more than something that is further away from water. So if you're splitting each plot into two, um, then you're you're really getting an accurate assessment of pretty much the same plot of land and how the wheat is going to grow. Um, on it with each fertilizer, okay? So when does randomization occur? Randomly assign treatment to first acre of each two acre plot. So which one gets assigned uh, to the first plot? The other one, that new fertilizer will get put on the other plot. So randomization, it reduces bias by spreading any uncontrolled compounding variables evenly throughout the treatment groups. Again, the whole point of just like when we talk about sampling with simple random sample, um, our, our goal is to eliminate as much bias as possible. Now, will there always be some sort of error? Yes, um, but our goal is to minimize that as much as we can, at least on what we can control. So bias is a systematic error in measuring the estimate. Blocking also helps reduce variability. Again, that's the whole point of blocking. If we think there, we're gonna get different results from male and female, well, then we should separate and get results based on male and female. That will shorten the range of data that you get for each section. Is there another way to reduce uh, variability? Uh, variability, and we're gonna talk about this all year long in statistics, variability is controlled by sample size. So larger samples produce statistics with less variability. Always, always, how do we uh, decrease variability we increase our sample size. And the reason that is, is that if you happen to have a possible outlier in your sample, well, the more other data values you have, the less likely that outlier is gonna be affecting that data or the less pull that outlier has on that data. So some visuals of bias and variability. Notice we have some dark boards there. The top left, um, notice um, we have high variability. Uh, the dots are all spread out. Uh, spread out, that word you'll love to use for your socks. Never, ever, ever say spread out when you are describing data. Uh, high bias, because again, we're not really towards the middle. Uh, top right, we have high bias. We're not really towards the, the center, but um, our points are very close together. We have small range, so low variability. Notice the bottom left dartboard, we have low bias. Um, they're more centered in the middle of the dartboard, but they're uh, much greater range, high variability. And our ideal is bottom right, where we have low bias and low variability.
So to say that something is statistically significant, that's actually the whole basis of doing statistics, why we get a sample and infer about the population is to see, oh, is this statistically significant? So the whole point of doing an experiment is to see, is an observed value so large that it would rarely occur by chance? And a statistically significant association in data from a well-designed experiment does imply causation. But only can you prove causation with a well-designed experiment. So complex issues of data ethics arise when we collect data from uh, people, as always, you know, humans, they could lie. How do we know when they're telling the truth? Here are some basic standards of data ethics that must be obeyed by all studies that gather data from human subjects, both observational studies and experiments. All planned studies must be reviewed in advance by an institutional review board charged with protecting the safety and well-being of the subjects. All individuals who are subjects in a study must give their informed consent before data is collected. And again, um, even this year, when you go collect uh, for your projects, um, you need to ask people permission. You always have to ask people permission before you collect their data, otherwise it's illegal. And all individual data must be kept confidential, okay? You're only using the data points. You should never state who those are actually from. And that is uh, part two of experimental design notes.